I depend on you. I depend on you for the sun to rise, for my sleep at night. I depend on you. Yes, I depend on you. I'm following. I depend on you. Yes, I depend on you for the victory. Still in front of me. Yes, I depend on you. Yes, I.
Well, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. And today we are looking at discerning Yahuwah's messengers and witnesses. And we will have a heavenly focus today on messengers and witnesses. So messengers and witnesses can relate to Yahuwah's son. It can relate to Yahuwah's people, can relate to his angelic heavenly host, and can even relate to his creation. We should keep this in mind especially when reading scripture that refers to angels or messengers, so as to identify the correct representative in that particular scripture. This holds true, especially in the book of Revelation and other prophetic books of the Bible. Why? Because in the end of days, the spiritual and natural realms will have an abundance of activity and there will be diverse entities functioning as messengers and witnesses. And there will even be an abundance of false messengers and witnesses. Much of this world continues to align with spiritual darkness. On the other hand, Yah's people, the remnant, continue to align with the spiritual power and light. This same atmosphere of light and darkness existed in the very days of Yahushua's first coming. And likewise, we will face similar depraved circumstances. Last week, we looked at Psalm 91, and I just want to review some of those verses. Verse one, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High, who abides under the shadow of the Almighty. He is saying of Yahuwah, my refuge and my stronghold, my Elohim in whom I trust. For he delivers you from the snare of a trapper, from the destructive pestilence. He covers you with his feathers and under his wings, and under his wings, you take refuge. His truth is a shield and armor. To dwell in the secret place and to abide under the shadow of the Almighty, we must first enter his manifest presence by walking and talking with him daily, just as Adam and Eve did in the garden. We know he's omnipresent, but at the same time, Adam and Eve walked with his manifested presence in the garden. For if we dwell in the secret place, we should be in his manifested presence every day. This was all made possible by Yahushua tearing down the partition of separation that was erected after Adam and Eve sinned. All resources are under his power and are available to provide a supernatural protection and or make us the gray man in times of persecution. We will go over several instances in the Bible about his supernatural protection and deliverance, but we may not get to those examples this Shabbat, but next Shabbat. This Shabbat, we will focus, focus more on the heavenly. In Hebrews chapter 12, 22 through 29, these are amazing verses. If you don't have them marked in your Bible, please do so. We start in verse 22 when it tells us, but you, we, but you have drawn near to Mount Zion and to the city of the living Elohim, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of messengers and to the entire gathering and assembly of the firstborn having been enrolled in heaven and to Elohim, the judge of all, and to the spirits of righteous men made perfect. That says a whole lot. And not only that, and to Yahushua, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. 
Well, do we realize that we have drawn near to Mount Zion, to the city of the living Elohim, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the myriads of messengers, to the entire gathering and assembly, to the firstborn having been enrolled in heaven, to the Elohim of the judge of all, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Yahushua, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, which speaks better than the blood of Abel? Do we really comprehend that that's who and those are who we've drawn near to? That, those verses are amazing just to, to meditate on those scriptures. And in verse 25, it says, take heed not to refuse the one speaking for if those did not escape who refused the warning on earth, much less we who turn away from him from heaven, whose voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised saying yet, and we need to remember this, Yet once more, yet once more, I shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. And this, yet once more, makes clear the removal of what is shaken as having been made so that the unshaken matters might remain. Therefore, Receiving an unshakable reign, let us hold the favor through which we serve Elohim pleasingly with reverence and awe, for indeed our Elohim is a consuming fire. Verse 11 through 13 of Psalm 91, for he commands, for he commands his messengers concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They bear you up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You tread upon lion and cobra, young lion and serpent. You trample underfoot. At his command, heavenly messengers can be dispatched to guard you and bear you up in their hands. He will make his people tread upon lion and cobra, young lion and serpents. You will trample underfoot. From the very beginning of Genesis 1-1, his desire has always been to protect us and deliver us from harm as a hen gathers her chick beneath her wings. Throughout Yah's word, he desire, his desire was to guide us through the wicked minefields of this fallen world by us following the leading and prompting of his spirit. In the first Exodus, he manifested his presence by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Even through the rebellion in the wilderness, he never left Israel, even though Israel left him. He is faithful and true, and he is coming again. And there will be a greater exodus that will pattern after the first exodus. So today, our focus will be to explore the heavenly perspective of messengers and witnesses. So to help us discover where we presently dwell, we must ask ourselves a question. Where is our treasure? That question is asked in Matthew chapter six. We read verse 19 through 22. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Okay, where treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart shall be also. The lamp of the body is the eye. 
If therefore your eye is good, all your body shall be enlightened. So when we give him our whole heart and soul, we lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. And like in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, we read, where your treasure is, there your heart shall be also. And we know by going through the fragmented soul series that heart and soul are synonymous. Your heart shall be also, or your soul shall be also. In verse 22, the lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, if your eye is good, all your body will be enlightened. Why? Because your body would be submitting to your soul and your soul would be submitting to his spirit within us. So your soul is inseparable from his spirit. Or do we not believe him when he told us he would never leave us or forsake us? In Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 19 through 21, we read, whenever the living beings or the living creatures moved, the wheels moved with them. And whenever the living beings rose from the earth, the wheels rose also. Wherever the spirit was about to go, they would go in that direction. And the wheels rose just as they did. For the spirit of the living beings, the living creatures, was in the wheels. Whenever those went, they went. And whenever those stopped, they stopped. And whenever those rose from the earth, the wheels rose just as they did. For the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. So these were cherubim described in Ezekiel and they had four heads, the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle. And these represented also the four lead banners of the four Israelite quadrants encamped around the dwelling place in the wilderness. There were, if you recall, three tribes per each quadrant. So when we read of the living creatures having three pairs of wings, this is our clue. They were covered with eyes, and that is another clue that we'll delve deeper into later. The lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle also represents Yahusha and the covenant-confirming gospel message. They represent Yahusha and the gospel, and also they represent Israel born from above. This is scripturally supported time and time again. The wilderness encampments even mirrored similar movements that we just read about in Ezekiel chapter 1. The wilderness encampments were the shadow picture of the original heavenly scenes. Everything was done in order and moved according to what? His spirit. Let's see how that manifested on earth. If we read Numbers chapter 9, verse 19 through 21. Even when the cloud lingered many days above the dwelling place, the children of Israel guarded the charge of Yahuwah and did not depart. And so it was when the cloud was above the dwelling place a few days, according to the mouth of Yahuwah, they camped. And when according to the mouth of Yahuwah, they would depart. And so it was when the cloud dwelt only from evening until morning. When the cloud was taken up in the morning, then they departed, whether by day or by night. Whenever the cloud was taken up, they departed. The living creatures has always been a fascinating topic. And if you look up the definition of the living creatures, the 
uh, Brown Driver Briggs definition defines the living creatures as living, alive. Second, defines them as relatives. Defines them also as living thing or an animal and even defines them as a community. The Strong's definition defines them as life, whether literally or figuratively, wild beast, or as a company, or as a congregation, a living creature, a living thing. It even defines them as a multitude. So it's very interesting to see how the living creatures are defined. And we know in Genesis and in Numbers and in Deuteronomy, when we read of Abraham, we read of Aaron, we read of Moses and so forth being gathered to their people. I believe the place that they were gathered was to Abraham's bosom. And, and that is what seems to be described among the cherubim and the wheels we read about in Ezekiel, as well as in Revelation chapter four and five. Based on the living creatures definitions, it does include relatives, company, congregation, and community. So we, we have to keep an open mind as to what is trying to be communicated to us in the scripture. The difference being that in Ezekiel, the partition of separation from the throne room still existed. If you read that chapter, you will see that there was a partition that separated at that time. But in Revelation chapter four, verse one, the partition of separation had been opened. The door had been opened. So in the wilderness, they traveled according to when the cloud moved. And you see the four lead banners before you, the lion, the man, the ox, and the eagle. And you see that behind them were three tribes each. Could they not be represented by three pairs of wings? I believe so. And, and these four lead banners connect to Israel. However, these four lead banners also connect to Yahusha as the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle. See, in the book of Matthew, Yahushua represented the lion, the righteous Zedekah king. In Luke, he represented the man. Yahushua, the great physician, friend of sinners, came in the likeness of man. In the book of Mark, Yahushua represented the ox. Yahushua, the servant, miracle, strength, and action, he was a burden bearer. He, tell, he would tell us, take on my yoke. In the book of John, he's reflected as an eagle, Yahushua, the word of Elohim that came down from heaven, emphasizing divinity. And we must not forget in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Messiah, he is a new creature. The old matters have passed away. See, all matters have become new. So this is very important when looking at our present reality and remembering that our reality is a type and shadow of what Moses saw in the heavenlies and what John the Revelator saw in the heavenlies. In Revelation verse one, chapter one, verse one, we read revelation of Yahushua Messiah, which Elohim gave him to show his servants what has to take place with speed. And he signified it by sending his messenger to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of Elohim and the witness of Yahushua Messiah to all he saw. Verse five, and from Yahushua Messiah, the trustworthy witness, see Yahushua himself was the trustworthy witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the sovereigns of the earth to him who loved us and washed us 
from our sins in his own blood and has made us sovereigns and priests to his Elohim and father, to him be esteemed and rule forever and ever. And in Revelation chapter three, verse 14, and to the messenger of the assembly in Laodicea, write the amen, the trustworthy and true witness, the beginning of the creation of Elohim says this. So Yahushua HaMashiach is identified as the trustworthy and true witness. And in Luke chapter 23, verse 33 through uh, 34, and when they had come to the place called Golgotha, they impelled him there. And the evil doers, one on the right and the other on the left. And Yahushua said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. In verse 44 through 46 of Luke chapter 3. And it was now about the sixth hour, and darkness came over all the land until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened. That was darkened for three hours. And the veil of the dwelling place was torn in two. And that veil was multiple inches, from what I've heard, four to five inches thick. And crying out with a loud voice, Yahushua said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Yahushua experienced that separation from the Father when he chose to lay down his life for our sins and take it back up again on the third day. Yahushua stands as a witness to all the world of his covenant-confirming gospel message. He took our sinful darkness, he took our pain, he took our suffering, he took our illnesses onto himself so that we could have life and have life more abundantly. I believe it was the darkest moment between the father and the son. Do we not think his father was with Yahushua during that critical time? Would any parent not be with their child facing a trial of such great multitude? Why do I believe his father was there? Well, for one thing, Yahushua spoke to his father. I believe the Father manifested in diverse ways on that day. Gil Broussard, a friend of mine, did a lot of work on the topic of Planet X. He, he dubbed his work Planet 7X to differentiate it from a, so much of the hype around the topic. And his work is truly incredible. And through meticulous research, he coordinated a majority of biblical events with the astronomical perturbation of the earth, the disturbance of the earth's atmosphere. He correlated all of those events, biblical events that occurred with possibly a planetary body or a mass of energy entering our solar system. Some may relate such anomalies purely to science, yet leave out the supernatural manifestations of Yahweh's presence. After all, it was recorded that Yah himself, and this is what it says in Joshua 10 verse 11, Yah himself threw down the hailstones and also in verse 13 of Joshua 10, he made the sun and moon stand still until Joshua's battle was complete. See, Yah is amazing. He can use any part of his creation whenever he so desires. It's not difficult for him to do that. He can do whatever he so desires. He created everything, did he not? It is often in these types of manifestations that let us know of 
his possible presence right among us. Think back to the first Exodus. Did Yahuwah use many of his creation elements to bring about the 10 plagues? Did he not attest that he led his people out of Egypt by his mighty right hand? Therefore, can we not consider that Yah's manifested presence blocked the light of the sun from shining on the earth for three hours? Would his powerful emotions not have caused the earth to quake as his heart was breaking for his son and his people? Was his wrath so great that he took pleasure in tearing that veil of separation between him and his people once and for all to glorify the finished work of his son? He had no problem and making all of those things happen. So messengers in the Bible can be defined in many ways. And, and we don't need just to lock into just one entity being a messenger because a messenger can is defined as being an ambassador, a king, a messenger, a representative, an angel, a prophet, a priest, a pastor, a teacher. Witnesses, they can be defined as being a witness of things or a witness of people. They can give testimony. They can be viewed as a recorder. And a witness can also be defined as a martyr. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 9 through 11, we read, I, John, both your brother and co-sharer in pressure and in the reign and endurance of Yahushua Messiah, came to be on the isle that is called Patmos for the word of Elohim and for the witness of Yahushua Messiah. I came to be in the spirit on the day of Yahuwah and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Aleph and the Tav, the first and the last and Write in a book what you see and send it to the seven assemblies of Asia, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamos and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. John the Revelator was exiled to Patmos for being Yah's witness. We know Paul was beheaded. We know Stephen was stoned in Acts chapter 7, we know Peter chose to be crucified upside down. Daniel was thrown into the lion's den and his three companions were thrown into the fiery furnace that was heated up seven times hotter, yet they were not consumed. And several others died martyred deaths. It was deaths of being a witness. John was not only a prophet and became known as John the Revelator, but he was also a witness. John was commissioned while on the Isle of Patmos to write in a book and he, what he saw and send it to the seven assemblies of Asia. So how did John see what to write? As John recorded, the scripture tells us he came to be in the spirit on the day of Yahuwah. Therefore, based on his experiences recorded in the book of Revelation, he not only saw a vision, he was teleported to the future time, to the day of Yahuwah. And we know Yahuwah lives outside of time. This appears to be much more than just a dream or an open vision. And I'm sure 
part of it was an open vision, but it does appear to be more because in Revelation chapter four, Revelation chapter four, John is told, come up here and I shall show you what has to take place after this. In verse 12 through 16 of Revelation 1, and I turned to see the voice which spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the son of Adam, dressed in a robe down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. And his head and hair were white as white wool, as snow, and his eyes as a flame of fire, and his feet like burnished brass as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And in his right hand, he held seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was as the sun shining in its strength. We must always keep in mind that the most powerful weapon that messengers and witnesses have is the sharp two-edged sword the word of Yah. When we take his word and we pray it, we speak it, and we receive and own his written promises, that is so powerful that it cuts through the kingdom of darkness. This is validated in Revelation chapter 11, verse 10, when the two witnesses lay dead in the street of Jerusalem. We read, and those dwelling on the earth rejoice over them and exult, and they shall send gifts to each other. Why? Because the people they were celebrating. Why were they celebrating the death of the two witnesses? And we will also see that they're referred to as two prophets in Revelation chapter 11, verse 10. They were celebrating because these two prophets tortured those dwelling on the earth. Do you ever think about how when we claim and read his word out loud and when we pray his promises and speak to one another in hymns and psalms, do we realize that that tortures the fallen, darkened realm? It does. His word is very powerful and it is sharper than any two-edged sword. It is our weapon. And that's why we need to hold on to his scripture verses and speak his word daily and gather in fellowship. Verse 17 through 20 of chapter one. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead and he placed his right hand on me. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. And I became dead and see, I am living forever and ever. Amen. And I possess, I possess the keys of Sheol and of death. Write, therefore, what you have seen, both what is now, both what is now and what shall take place after these. The secret of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are messengers of the seven assemblies and the seven lampstands, which you saw, are seven assemblies. And we have established that messengers can be angelic as well as they can be designated believers in Yah, but we all are to be his witnesses. In Revelation 19.10, and in Revelation 22, there are some interesting accounts when we find John bowing down to the feet of the messengers. So in Revelation chapter 19, 10, you might want to mark these two places. 
we read, and I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, see, do not do it. I am your fellow servant and of your brothers who possess the witness of Yahusha. Worship Elohim for the witness of Yahusha is the spirit of prophecy. And in Revelation chapter 22, verse 8 and 9, and I, John, saw and heard these matters. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the messenger who showed me these matters. And he said to me, see, do not. For I am your fellow servant of your brothers, the prophets, and of those who are guarding the words of this book. Worship Elohim. If you look back in Revelation chapter 21, 9, you see who this messenger actually was. Because you know the chapters and verses were added in after the fact. But John had been talking to one of the seven messengers who held the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues. And that's who came to him and spoke with him saying, come, I shall show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And it appears to be the same messenger that, that is speaking to John here in Revelation 22, 8. So we see how at times in the book of Revelation, the term messenger can switch between identifying an angelic messenger versus a designated fellow believers, Selah. I mean, get your head wrapped around that. There's a lot of things going up in the heavenlies that we must consider. Therefore, personally, I do not see how we can get around that there are ascended souls of the saints already in the heavenlies awaiting their resurrected body. And that only could occur from the time that Yahushua first entered heaven and opened the door in Revelation 4, because no one could have entered heaven before him. No one. They were still in the bosom of Abraham, the comfort side of Sheol. Did not Yahushua ascend before he received his resurrected body? Yes. We also know of two ascended souls that manifested with Yahushua on the Mount of Olives, and that was Moses and Elijah. We have also already established that wherever his spirit goes, the souls of believers follow. This pattern was established in the movement in the wilderness encampments and in Ezekiel chapter one with the four living creatures and the wheels. And please, I'm not saying I have all this figured out. I'm laying it on the table. I'm breaking bread with my brothers and sisters for things to consider. In John chapter 11, verse 23 through 26, Yahushua said to Martha, Martha, after Lazarus' death, your brother shall rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Now, if she had that totally corrected, correct, he could have stopped there. But he goes on, Yahushua said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he dies, he shall live. And everyone that is living and believing in me shall never die at all. Do you believe this? He asked Martha. And that's the same question we must ask ourselves. Do we believe what he just told Martha? In Revelation chapter five, verse one through five, we read, and I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll written inside and on the back 
having been sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong messenger proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loosen its seals? And no one in the heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. And I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. And one of the elders said to me, okay, so now we have an elder speaking to John. Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, overcame to open the scroll and to loosen its seven seals. And I looked and saw in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders, a lamb standing as having been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of Elohim sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him sitting on the throne. And when he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of the set apart ones. So when we pray, <laughs> when we pray, our prayers are transmitted into the heavenlies and they fill these golden bowls which are incense that are brought before the throne room. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll. I mean, this was a legal transaction. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and have redeemed us to Elohim by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and made us sovereigns and priests to our Elohim and we shall reign upon the earth. Right now, they're in the heavenlies, but they say they shall reign upon the earth. So who was singing this new song? It said the four living creatures were and the 24 elders. And what do they sing? They sing, you have redeemed us. You have redeemed us by your blood. And where are they from? Well, they identify who they are. They are those out of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And what have the Lamb made them in that song? They said, because you have made us sovereigns, kings, and priests to our Elohim. And what will the living creatures and 24 elders do? They shall reign upon the earth. Now, the living creatures are a type of angelic being for sure. They do represent those of Israel because they are similar to the four lead banners, the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle. And they are covered with eyes, which are the windows to the soul. And they have six wings or three pairs of wings representing the, the each quadrant that was in the wilderness encampment. And we know that souls need some type of transporting body. So is it possible that he keeps those ascended souls under his wings, his wings of the seraphim, because the cherubim that we read about in Ezekiel, those are a more powerful angelic being 
They and they were a little bit different than the seraphim type in Revelation 5 because the cherubim in Revelation 1, they had four heads. They consisted of all the tribes, tongue, people, and nations in one. So they very well could have been a conglomeration of those serving as his priests from every tongue, tribe, people, and nation. The outer encampments, if you will, around the throne room could be the rest of the redeemed souls. We don't know exactly. I mean, we can only speculate about some of the meanings to this, but I believe they are much more than just unusual creatures. Just like Yahushua is represented as a lion of the tribe of Judah and as the lamb having been slain, is it, is it far-fetched to see our, our presence, redeemed souls that have gone on before us? Is it so far-fetched to see them also as some type of creature? I think not. I think not. So in addition, we see that the lamb standing as having been slain had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of Elohim. But also keep in mind in Revelation chapter four, verse five, that there's also another definition. And out of the throne came lightnings and thunders and voices and seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of Elohim. So the seven horns and the seven eyes and the, the seven lamps of fire are referred to as the seven spirits of Elohim. Those seven spirits of Elohim are identified and defined in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. The spirit of Yahweh shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, and the fear of Yahweh. In verse 11 through 14, closing Revelation 5, and I looked and I heard the voice of many, many messengers around the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them were myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb having been slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and respect and esteem and blessing. And I believe today they are having a hallelujah moment right now because this is Shabbat. And every creature, get this, and every creature which is, which is in the heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying to him sitting on the throne and to the lamb, be the blessing and the respect and the esteem and the might forever and ever. Because Yahushua HaMashiach not only re redeemed us, he re redeemed all creation and he redeemed the land. Those were the three things that he redeemed in the scroll that was sealed. And he was the only one that had the legal right, the legal authority to open that seven sealed scroll. Verse 14, and the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and bowed before him who lives forever and ever. So this is one very, very active and very crowded scene in the heavenlies. We not only have Yahweh Yahusha, we have elders. We have four living creatures, which are probably seraphim creatures that help mobilize the living souls until they get their resurrected body. Because right now they're in an atmosphere that's beyond our imagination. There are also angelic messengers. We saw that right there in verse 11. And look, and I looked and I heard the voice of many messengers, angelic messengers, in addition to the living creatures, in addition to the elders. 
And there were also every creature which is in the heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such that are in the sea. And later, if that's not enough, if that's not enough, there's even more added in Revelation 7 after the 144,000 are sealed. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 through 11, we read, after this, I looked and saw a great crowd, which no one was able to count out of all the nations and tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, dressed in white robes and palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice saying, deliverance belongs to our Elohim who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the messengers stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped Elohim. Verse 13 and 14. And one of the elders responded saying to me, who are these dressed in white robes? And where did they come from? And I said to him, Master, you know. And he said to me, These are those coming out of the great distress, having washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The interesting question posed here is that, okay, now John is speaking to an elder. And which elder do you think he may have picked? You know, he may have picked himself. He may have seen himself in this future setting and asked himself because he was an elder. And that would be very interesting to contemplate that one. So next Shabbat, we will continue seeing the roles of messengers and witnesses from an earthly perspective. We looked at a heavenly perspective and we really pretty much just skimmed the surface. But next week, we're going to look at it at the witnesses and messengers from an earthly perspective. And next week, I'm also going to include the five V's, but I'm going to show how those five V's can be used in another way by the enemy and how the enemy uses those five V's against Yahweh's witnesses. So until then, Shabbat Shalom.